You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with With Sam Sam Steeter. It is Tuesday. May 8th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Stacey Mitchell, co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, will join us to discuss both her piece in The Nation on why Amazon is not looking to win the market, but rather become the market. And also her piece in The Nation magazine, Six Steps to Getting Rid of Toxic Monopolies. Also on the program, we're pre-recording this because we're in the middle of a set um, redo. But now I'm going to throw... To me, doing the headlines in our makeshift set. Thanks, Sam. And the headlines for today, New York AG Eric Schneiderman gone. Accused of abuse of four women in New Yorker magazine resigns two hours later. Meanwhile, Trump announcing his plans regarding the Iran deal this afternoon. Everyone anticipates him trying to crash the deal. And Ollie North, named president of the NRA because, of course. Meanwhile, the Republicans and Trump looking for a do-over on the budget. They want to claw back $15 billion. A big chunk of that is children's health care. Meanwhile, Jeff Sessions to undocumented immigrants. We will take your babies. And Ben Carson and HUD don't want anti-discrimination policies when it comes to housing. All this and, well, not much more on today's show. Uh, We are in the midst of building the set. Maybe you can hear the banging in the background. And uh, I just wanted to give you one update on the uh, Schneiderman situation. So he is gone. What will happen next is that the New York Senate and Assembly will meet. And this is actually pretty important because the the New York Senate, as you know, because of Andrew Cuomo's shenanigans, is controlled essentially by Republicans. However, in this instance, all of them will get together. They will have all one vote. And because the state assembly is dominated by Democrats, The replacement for Schneiderman will be a Democrat. That person will serve until November. So there will be a primary and then there will be a general election for the next attorney general. A lot of names have been floated around. We'll see if Zephyr Teach outs one of those people. Preet Bharara. God help us if it's Mark Green. But we will uh, we will talk more about that tomorrow. Also, we will catch you up on the implications of Donald Trump announcing that he wants to have the United States unilaterally break uh, the Iran deal. Uh, We will be live tomorrow. We will discuss those stories and more. In the meantime, back to constructing our set and avoiding falling pipes. There you go. Back to you, Sam. Folks, uh, so uh, just a reminder, I know what you were saying, Brendan. Uh, oh, thank you, Sam. Back to uh, me. Um, Brendan was suggesting that what we should just do is I just mouth all the words and uh, we just lay, <laughs> that's what you were saying, right? Maybe that's what we end up doing. So, okay. So uh, let me just uh, go back over what just happened. We either threw to me in the um, in the uh, sort of the makeshift set for the day, or we literally just I recorded the audio and it seemed a little bit out of sync to you because I had recorded that um, 
yesterday. So uh, as long as we're clear on that, I think we'll probably go with that, the, the latter one. It's going to be weird, and a lot of you are probably like still your fingers are hurting for actually on the chat. Like, hey, what, 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 what was that about? There's something way, way off with the sync. He's not the even future, remotely. It's just you phoning in the audio. <laughs> Exactly. Recording all the video on they'll the just, They'll just be a version of me just going, watermelon, 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 watermelon. And uh, then I'll just call it in. It's sort of like, it's like, it's basically like the Dennis Miller show. Right? Oh, why am I so chipper today? No, yeah, this is a great opportunity. This is part of the reason why I wanted to let you folks know that I was now uh, separated. Uh, was so that when I talked about buying, like, so I got a new set of Brooklyn and sheets. In fact, I got two new sets of Brooklyn and sheets. And now I don't have to feel awkward. I mean, it's awkward, but I don't have to feel awkward about talking about why I got it. I got, listen, I had to get another apartment. Um, and the first thing I did, literally the first thing I did was I got, uh, two new sets of Brooklyn and sheets, the kind that I like <laughs> the crispy, cool cotton ones. The era of the pajama boy is over. That's right. And now he gets his own sheets. You spend a third of your life in your sheets. They make a difference on how you sleep. They do for me. You can start getting better sleep with the best sheets, brooklinen.com. They are the best, most comfortable sheets. No big markup. You can upgrade your nightly routine and feel more well-rested every day. They were founded in April, I guess now, like three years ago, four years ago, by a husband and wife team. I hope they don't mind that I'm so excited about my sheets uh, as a function of the fact that I've ended my situation like that. But uh, their philosophy, the most beautiful, comfortable home essentials, no crazy prices, no unnecessary markups and fees. They got versatile colors and patterns. I like to go with the bold stripes, frankly. It's just the way I roll. You can mix and match uh, to match any, uh, to complement any decor. This is luxury bedding and it's underpriced. You have to try these sheets today. My Brooklyn and sheets are the best. They are the most comfortable sheets I've slept on, and now I get to sleep on them all the time. Brooklinen.com has an exclusive offer for just Majority Report listeners. Get 20 bucks off and free shipping when you use the promo code MAJORITY at Brooklinen.com. Brooklinen is so confident that they offer a risk-free 60-night satisfaction guarantee and a lifetime warranty on all their sheets and comforters. I hope they're prepared because I, I wear, I literally wear through sheets. The only way to get twenty dollars off and free shipping, you use the promo code Majority at Brooklinen.com. That's Brooklinen, B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N, Brooklinen.com. Promo code Majority, Brooklinen. These are the best sheets ever. Okay, folks, so uh, we've got an interview with Stacey Mitchell coming up. She's the co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And um, as you know, we've talked to a lot of people about the, uh, both the problem and the solutions of monopoly in this country. The, the change in philosophy about antitrust that took place during the Reagan administration as a function of... Uh, University of Chicago and, and Robert Bork and that whole crew. Uh, so Stacy Mitchell has a, a very interesting, fascinating take on Amazon and what we need to do to fix monopolies in general. Uh, reminder, we will be back live tomorrow if everything goes well. And uh, we will have a, a fancy new set. And tonight, there will be no uh, Michael Brooks show tonight. Just want to be clear on that. It's going to happen tomorrow night, Wednesday night, and he's going to have a new I – mean, I think it, it should look different. That's a sure thing. He was less certain than I than you were when I asked him. That it was going to be on Wednesday? That he thought there might be a chance it was on Tuesday, but perhaps it's on Wednesday. I guess it's possible. Stay tuned, yeah, but we'll it's keep you up highly there. unlikely. Okay. But it's possible, but it's highly unlikely. But it's possible. 
So either way, check uh, 7 p.m. tonight, the Michael Brooks Show. If not tonight, then tomorrow night, the Michael Brooks Show. And you can subscribe on iTunes. You won't miss it either way. Also, don't forget to check out uh, Jamie's uh, podcast at patreon.com slash the Antifada. And as always, uh, your membership supports this show. Go to jointhemajorityreport.com, jointhemajorityreport.com. All right, quick break, then Stacy Mitchell. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Stacy Mitchell. She's the co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Uh, about uh, two pieces that you've had in uh, the Nation magazine uh, over the past couple of months. Uh, the first one being about Amazon. Stacy, welcome to the program. It's great to be here. So let's start with... Um, y- You start your story about uh, Amazon by following a specific uh, seller of uh, of sporting goods. Just tell us a little bit. I mean, walk us through that process. How does someone or I guess a um, a seller end up on uh, Amazon and what are the different, I guess, um, uh, statuses that one has as a seller on Amazon? Yeah, yeah. I opened the story with um, the story of Gazelle Sports, which is an independent uh, sporting goods store in Michigan. Uh, they have about five, uh, four or five outlets. They have over 200 employees. They've been in business for a long time, and they're really beloved. I mean, they're one of the top-ranked running shoe stores in the country. Um, and they had an e-commerce site of their own for quite a long time, but they found that there was not as much traffic on that over time as they would like. And much of it was because uh, Amazon is sucking up so much of the consumer traffic now. Um, more than half of all online shoppers are now starting their search on Amazon. So they're not going through a search engine like Google where they might find Gazelle Sports or another competitor. They're just starting right on Amazon's platform. And so Gazelle Sports, which you know competes directly with Amazon, um, really felt compelled at some point to become a third-party seller in Amazon's marketplace. And a lot of uh, independent retailers and chain retailers and manufacturers of all sizes are in the same position. And many of them are feeling as though the only way they can reach consumers is to essentially ride the rails, if you will, of their most ferocious competitor. And so basically Amazon gets to a um, – they, they work their way <laughs> – to a sort of a critical mass where you get the, that many people just starting on Amazon for the search and everything becomes sort of a closed universe in a way. Yeah, I mean, Jeff Bezos has really figured out how to, you know, collapse what, you know, what seems like this wide open world wide web, this wide open arena for commerce. He's really managed to figure out how to make it a winner take all uh, scenario. And a lot of that is through Prime. I mean, Prime, uh, you know, was, a, was the annual membership program they started way back in 2005. And people thought it was sort of crazy at the time, but it was really prescient because, um, you know, Prime, you pay, it was $100 a year. Now it's about $120 a year. Um, and it's, you know, it's not for Amazon. It's not about getting that money so much as the fact that once you've paid that money, you naturally want to maximize the value you get out of it in terms of free shipping. It's just sort of an inherent thing that, you know, the more you order from Amazon, the more that $120 uh, gets you uh, in value. And so what has happened is that as more and more people have signed up for Prime, and, and now more than half of all U.S. households are Prime members, what researchers find is that they no longer comparison shop so much. Uh, they tend to just go straight to Amazon. Um, and so Amazon has become this kind of gatekeeper for uh, all of online commerce. You know, the, the whole sort of consumer goods economy increasingly is having to run through Amazon. And this is, um, you titled your piece, Amazon doesn't just want to dominate market. It wants to become the market. And so there is, um, they are, they're basically creating the, the physics of the universe that you can sell in. And then they're stepping in as a uh, as a comp- as a direct competitor 
uh, and I guess basically impacting those physics. Explain how they do that. Yeah, you know, we um, we often think of Amazon or, and talk about Amazon as a retailer. Um, and, you know, certainly they sell a lot of stuff. I mean, they capture half of all online spending. They're the biggest seller of books, apparel, consumer electronics, uh, and toys of anyone online or off. So they are, in a way, this huge retailer. But to think of them as a retailer really misses the nature of the company and also misses the nature of the threat that it poses to our economy and, and ultimately to our democracy. Amazon is really an, is an infrastructure company. Um, and right now they have these three big pieces of infrastructure. And this is the infrastructure that other companies need in order to uh, operate. So uh, one big piece of that is the platform. Um, you know, as I said, lots of other companies now really feel there's no other choice but to be on Amazon's platform in order to reach consumers. Uh, another big piece of infrastructure that Amazon has is cloud computing. Um, they control about 40% of the world's cloud computing capacity. Um, and lots of companies, Netflix, Condé Nast, the magazine publisher, um, Comcast, uh, even the CIA, uh, rely on Amazon for managing their data in the cloud. Majority uh, so again, report. Another the, majority uh, report. The majority right? report. Our <laughs> our podcasts are served uh, through our, our through Fans FM, are housed on uh, Amazon servers. Right. Right. So lots of companies, again, that compete with Amazon in various ways rely on its cloud services. And then the, the third big piece of infrastructure that they're building out is uh, shipping and package delivery. So they're really looking to take on and supplant like UPS and the Postal Service uh, and, and are you know, very much on their way to doing that. And so the future that they have in mind is one in which um, any other company really that wants to reach consumers either with products or uh, digital content um, is going to need to you know, be on Amazon's platform using Amazon's cloud and relying on Amazon's delivery services to get stuff to people's doors. That's an incredibly um, powerful position and also an incredibly lucrative position for Amazon because you know, it, what it means essentially is that by controlling these pipelines, Amazon can decide um, to pick off the most lucrative segments of consumer spending for itself. So it can decide, here are the products and services that we want to offer, and we can privilege our own products and services on these pipelines. Uh, we can demote everybody else in the search results and give ours first bidding. Um, and then for everything else that we don't want to deal with, we'll let other companies handle that, and we will levy a kind of tax on their trade um, through the fees that we charge them. And so no matter who's doing what, Amazon gets paid. It's very lucrative. It's also monopoly power. I mean, in, in some respects, at least part of this, I mean, because it's so huge in the way that they have uh, monopolized this space, um, there's an element of net neutrality involved in this, right? Like they're going to privilege their own products over... Um, uh, they own the pipes and they're going to basically say the first things into the pipes are going to be the products that we sell, whether that's, um, and, and, and talk about that, that aspect of it, uh, in terms of like the, the buy box and that specifically they know what is selling. And so talk about an instance where they, where they see what is selling and they'll jump in and start selling that thing and put themselves in the prime position to sell it. Yeah, they, 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 you know, the, the peril of being a seller on Amazon's platform, and you can certainly go out and find businesses that have figured out a way and are doing well, especially if they have a unique product that only they make. Um, you know, they can, you know, people can have su success there, certainly, but it is an incredibly perilous road, and you are at the mercy of Amazon, which at any moment can change the terms of uh, doing business on its site, can raise the fees, can even suspend your account. Sellers live in this like fear of being suspended because Amazon does it frequently and arbitrarily, and it's very difficult to get it reinstated. It's a mysterious process. I mean, so you're, you know, you're kind of dealing with this sort of lord of the manor, um, and you can, you know, till your little plot, but only under the terms that they set. So there are lots of examples, both in the reporting and also some good research studies that 
point to the fact or, or illustrate the fact that Amazon um, mines that data that it gets from the sellers and looks for areas where it can use that information to then compete against those businesses on its platform. So one example of this, um, you know, from a couple of years ago was a small company in, uh, in the Bay Area that makes these uh, nifty uh, lap- laptop stands. Um, it's a company called Rain Design. And they had built up a, a small but thriving business, mainly selling on Amazon's platform, also some through their own website, but most of it was through Amazon. They, you know, their stands were, you know, number one, two, and three in the rankings. They had like hundreds and hundreds of, you know, top consumer reviews um, on the site. One morning they got up and the number one, two, and three um, uh, laptop stands in the search results were Amazon brand laptop stands that looked exactly like theirs, but had the Amazon logo instead of their own. Um, and their business, you know, sort of fell dramatically as a result of that. We know that this happens systematically and in part because folks like the, um, there's a study done by Harvard Business Review that found when sellers list new products within a few weeks, uh, about 25% of their most popular items uh, get brought into Amazon inventory. Uh, ProPublica did a, another uh, analysis where they found that uh, Amazon often awards what's called the buy box, and that's that's the seller that gets the is the default seller on that product page. So if you're looking at it and you you just want to choose the default option and put it straight into your shopping cart, that's that's the seller that's that's what they say has gotten the buy box. Well, ProPublica found that Amazon um, commonly rewards the awards the buy box to itself or other sellers who use its uh, fulfillment services, even if there's a seller that has a lower price or a higher uh, customer review, they will be knocked down uh, in, in the rankings and not seen by many people. So there are all kinds of ways in which Amazon really manipulates you as a seller and uses that knowledge to benefit itself and undermine you. And, and, you know, as we, we begin to sort of, um, we, we see the problems and we put it in the context of, of antitrust, um, this, the idea of competing with, um, with Amazon is also, I mean, um, is also essentially debt, right? I mean, no investor is going to say, <laughs> there's no answer you can give. I mean, in, in fact, on our show, we, um, we're 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 promoting uh, Jet.com um, uh, on occasion, which is you know from another behemoth, uh, but they they can't even make a dent in in Amazon's uh, 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 you know business, and so if I'm coming with like the next Amazon, I'm going to get laughed out of any room, right, where there's any investors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, who's going to who's going to invest in that and and. You know, we, Amazon has this track record of when, uh, when you know, and, and this goes back a few years, but when there were successful startups that, that were competing well against it, uh, Amazon used really aggressive tactics to uh, uh, take over their business. So a good example is Zappos, the shoe company. You know, they came along in around 2007, 2008. They were really popular um, and growing rapidly. People really liked the business. Amazon came to them and said, we want to buy you. And the founder said, we're not interested in selling. Um, And Amazon proceeded to then sell shoes at a loss, um, at a steep loss with free shipping. um, And they lost an estimated $150 million uh, selling shoes at a loss. Zappos had to try to match their pricing and then started bleeding red. And as a smaller company and without the kind of investor backing that Amazon enjoys, you know, eventually they just gave in and they sold. And so Zappos is now Amazon. Uh, same thing happened with diapers.com. You know, so every time a company has come along and succeeded in beginning to challenge them, they have used this kind of predatory tactic, really drawing on their, their financial might. So at this point, yeah, who, who would invest? Um, in a business that that might start up and, and compete against Amazon. And, you know, this really also just filters right down to the community level because, you know, we've seen um, a really dramatic collapse in new business formation. Um, we're now creating new businesses um, uh, at one-third the rate that we were about 25 years ago. It's just steadily, steadily declined, and particularly in the last 10 years, you know, we think we're this like nation of startups, this nation of entrepreneurs, 
But in fact, we're creating far fewer new businesses than, than we used to. And economists who are looking at this problem, um, you know, really many of them are pointing to concentrated power. So we've got too many industries where they're just dominated by these one or two big companies and no one can break in because they have enough power to keep all those new entrants out. And of course, it's hard to get a loan or to get investment because investors recognize this problem. I mean, wasn't it the case that, you know, if you were if if a a, a company purposely um, lost money on something to drive other people out of business, wasn't that the case that at one point that was illegal? Maybe I'm imagining that, but I thought that was you just it was against antitrust laws. That's absolutely right. And, and technically, it still is illegal. Those laws are still on the books. Um you know, back uh, between about 1890 and, you know, through the 1930s, we passed a series of antitrust laws. Um, and the, the very first of those laws is actually were, were inspired by the railroads, which at the time were doing something like Amazon is doing. You know, these industrialists got uh, control of the railroads, and then they used that to um, discriminate against and block their competitors from being able to get to market. They said, oh, sorry, you know, you're competing against me in this industry. I'm not going to let you ride the rail that I own. And that's what inspired our very first antitrust laws. Um, and we've passed, you know, we passed a number of them, including uh, laws that prohibit what's known as predatory pricing, which is when you sell at a loss in order to get rid of the competition, just what we've seen uh, Amazon doing. But we really stopped enforcing predatory pricing um, beginning in the 1980s. Um, there was a real um, uh, intellectual or ideological shift that came along at that time. It was sort of codified um, in how we enforce our antitrust laws. We didn't change the laws, but we changed the guidelines uh, and the ways that we interpret and enforce them. The result is that we don't really prosecute predatory pricing anymore. Let's talk about that, uh, just briefly, about that change in philosophy. It was driven by um, folks out of the University of Chicago, particularly uh, Robert Bork, who went on to um, be an ill-fated uh, Supreme Court nominee. But th- it, was the, it was the Reagan era where the, the shift on, on antitrust occurred. Tell us, like, where, just philosophically and sort of like on, on, in terms of the principles that were associated with antitrust, before uh, this sort of Borkian turn, and then where they went. Yeah, so the, the you know the way that we um, the way that we used to think about uh, antitrust and and talk about monopoly was in a really very broad way. I mean, there are our antitrust laws were very much about protecting democracy with this idea that you know if you have uh, companies that gain too much economic power, they essentially are kind of like autocrats. They control a lot of your, you know, people's lives and people's communities, and therefore there's something inherently political and anti-democratic about that. And so um, that sort of spirit of democracy, um, of wanting to disperse power as a basic principle of democracy, and also a principle of opportunity and the sense of, of equality and fairness in the marketplace where you know, people could have a good idea and come in and compete on equal terms. Um, that was how we thought about antitrust. And you know, in those decades, and I'm, I'm talking about sort of the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, ordinary people talked about monopoly. I mean, you can go back and look at the newspapers then and look at like State of the Union speeches given by presidents, both Democrat and Republican. They all talk about monopoly. And, you know, every time they give a State of the Union, they talk about concentrated power and the importance of what they're doing to, uh, to keep companies in check and make sure there's real competition and open markets. Um, so it was just a very, um, you know, publicly engaged, sort of vigorous, approach to antitrust. And when when enforcers looked at antitrust issues or looked at questions around mergers and whether to go after and break up a particular company, they often looked at it in a structural way. And so the idea was that you would look at a market and say, well, is this a market that has lots of competitors? Is this a market where a new business that wants to come in is going to be able to do so without getting blocked by a powerful company? So they looked at whether the basic structure of the market was competitive. You know, no one had too big of a market share. And that helped to guide how they made decisions. 
Um, and then in the 1970s, there arose this um, you know, group of legal and economic scholars often associated with the University of Chicago. They're kind of referred to as the Chicago School, led by Bork and, and other folks, um, who said, no, 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 none of that matters. The only thing that matters, they said, is what's the most efficient way to organize business. And, you know, big companies, they said, often are more efficient. They have economies of scale. So we should really let up. We should only look at this question of if this merger happens, could it yield efficiencies that might lower prices? And this has been known as the consumer welfare standard. And, you know, many of us, you know, have only, you know, we've sort of grew up under this. And so when we think about antitrust, we imagine, you know, the current doctrine, which is that the only question is, will this raise or lower consumer prices? Um, there are a lot of reasons that that's a, a bad way to uh, look at antitrust and approach antitrust. I mean, one is that, you know, we actually haven't been very good at keeping consumer prices low. As a result, we're actually seeing consumer prices uh, rise as a result of a lot of these mergers. A lot of the models that they use aren't very good. But it's also because in the process of focusing only on consumers, we've really lost track of the fact that our economic well-being also depends on our ability to earn a decent wage and that we're, you know, that we're also citizens and that part of this is about democracy, equality, liberty, you know, all of those deep values. And that's what's really been lost uh, as this Chicago school has uh, taken hold. I mean, just as an example, in terms of uh, political power, uh, just because it's incredibly convenient to bring up because it just happened literally yesterday, the I guess Wednesday of, uh, of this past week. And I think we're running this uh, uh, this interview on on Tuesday. So it's five or six days ago. Um, Amazon has threatened essentially the city of Seattle. Uh, it has paused construction on a new downtown Seattle tower until the city council votes on, on a tax to fund a homelessness program because uh, they don't want the tax. I mean, this is uh, the, the ability to hold a city hostage like this is, um, I mean, somewhat problematic, obviously. And this is just a, a, another example of that. Um, the fact that we have so few startups and um, and we have so little ability to, um, uh, we have diminished competition in terms of employers means that we have stagnant wages, which contributes to uh, income inequality and et cetera, et cetera. So there's, the idea is that at its heart is this fundamental difference of philosophy when it comes to antitrust. There are examples of this, I mean, I guess in the 90s too, the Sin Fin laws where, um, you know, which was was akin to the the old uh, laws involving uh, movie theaters, like movie theaters, movie studios couldn't own movie theaters so that the, the the consumers could have the opportunity to see a variety of movies, never mind, you know, cheaper ones or not. And it, I guess it's just a much more complex version of that. Um, before we sort of broaden this out as to how we deal with um this this type of, of toxic uh, monopolization, as you call it, um, just speak a little bit to the the idea of Whole Foods and um, the Amazon's plans in terms of like delivery services, because it seems to me they're um, the, at least within the context of delivery. Uh, they're going to do sort of similar thing to what they did in their in their marketplace, which is. We'll leave the public sector to um, take the less lucrative routes, and we'll take the lucrative routes. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, you know, I was last year. It was amazing. Um, I mean, and as an example of how far astray our antitrust enforcement has has become, you know, the the the, the in antitrust agencies. You know, when the Whole Foods merger was proposed last year, they didn't even do an in depth analysis. They did just a cursory review and green lighted it. And that was it. Um, and just, you know, when you at that time, you look at a company that was capturing one out of every two dollars Americans spent online, a company that essentially already had monopoly power in one market and was using that monopoly power to enter another market. I mean, that is exactly what our antitrust laws speak to. But yet, um, federal agencies said, uh, it's fine. We're not going to we're not going to worry about it. 
Um, you know, with, with Whole Foods, Amazon is gaining uh, an important foothold in a really significant industry, which is our food system. About 20% of all retail sales are groceries. Um, and it's very pivotal, um, you know, where you shop for groceries starts to shape a lot of other decisions that you make about where you shop and what you buy. Um, so Amazon got that out of it, but it also um, got the ability to begin to use Whole Foods locations, and there are about 500 or so around the country, as um, uh, delivery nodes in its growing shipping and package delivery operations. Um, those Whole Foods stores are often situated, you know, in urban areas where there are lots of people around. They're often in, you know, relatively well-off neighborhoods, the exact customer that Amazon wants. And so it's beginning to use Whole Foods stores now. You know, not only do they have the lockers where you can pick up your other Amazon orders, but they're now um, reserving spaces in the parking lots and beginning to stage um, these sort of mini distribution operations out of there, um, often using like flex drivers, which is a kind of Uber-like system people can sign up for uh, doing Amazon deliveries with their own cars. And, you know, you get paid a piece rate uh, for a two-hour shift. You know, it's that sort of a model. Um, but this was a big uh, uh, win for Amazon in terms of growing its distribution network and also beginning to um, uh, sort of merge online and offline shopping. I mean, I think the idea here is that um, there's going to be less and less difference between online and offline, that basically Amazon is going to be tracking you in its growing network of physical stores uh, and sort of merging that with its digital tracking of you, and they'll, they'll no, there'll be less and less distinction over time. And what that means is that Amazon, <clears throat> excuse me, will be able to like leverage its online power um, in the offline world and gain market share uh, against brick and mortar retailers that way. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit. I mean, having sort of established the the. And, and Amazon is seems to me to be uh, you know the, a great way to teach um, the the problems with uh, this type of monopolies you know beyond uh, the the pricing I mean you know it, it seems self evident that once there are no more uh, retailers Amazon's going to have a lot more flexibility with what they charge people on things uh, but even putting that aside. The, the implications of an entity this large and this and having so many tentacles, um, and even aside from the idea that its um, its owner would uh, would have no idea what to do with all the money they're making, as opposed to paying um, uh, some of their employees, they've got to go to space to burn it essentially. <laughs> um, I mean, even putting that stuff aside, we've established sort of the different dynamics that make monopolies problematic. And it's clear there has been um, that this change in philosophy has metastasized and we have seen less and less uh, enforcement of, of antitrust along those principles that, that it existed in this country for 60, 70 years in the 20th century. You've written a, a piece about six ways to rein in these monopolies. Let's let's go through these uh, these six uh, measures, if you don't mind. One is to first hold field hearings on the impact of concentrated economic power. This, I think, is um, and obviously I think it's a great place to start because it raises the awareness of people in different industries and in different geographies around the country. Um, because, you know, we don't hear very much about how farmers um, have problems with um, major agricultural uh, corporations that are that are um, undercutting them. I mean, is that the idea? Is it basically just begins to educate people as to the the idea of that they're, the problems they're experiencing are not unique or anomalies? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, farmers, you know, dairy farmers, for example, often only have one or two processors that they can sell their milk to. So they're really beholden to these kind of monopoly companies. Um, there are lots of different kinds of small businesses that experience this in their industries and workers as well. I mean, there's a growing uh, uh, economic body of economic research showing that um, workers' wages are being held down because there's just not enough competition in, in most labor markets 
uh, for their labor. There are just too few companies. And so I, I think that there are lots of ways in which people have a, a, per, a story to tell in their own lives that speaks to the consequences of monopoly. I think a big, you know, we, there's been a, a big uh, sort of growing conversation in Washington about monopoly. There is more concern among economists and, and journalists and, and some lawmakers about this issue and sort of more recognition. But I think in order to really generate the momentum that we need to um, to make some real changes in how we approach this, it's going to have to be grass, you know, it's going to be bottom up and involve the public. And it's going to, what I like about the idea of doing field hearings is that it's going to enable people to connect those dots and see how you know, so many of us are affected by this problem. And also for, for lawmakers um, to really hear from their constituents and to begin to, to recognize how much this is affecting their home communities. Uh, it's interesting, and I, I haven't seen any, any studies uh, to this uh, effect that may exist, but we, um, this week, again, we've seen uh, unemployment dip below uh, 4%. Uh, largely attributable to people leaving the the uh, the workforce. Nevertheless, I mean that is uh, we haven't hit that in almost 20 years. Uh, but wages are basically frozen. If anything, it's uh, there. There's there's sort of like a downward pressure on wages, and I I wonder uh, if we will uh, come to understand that this is a function of of monopoly power. That uh, you know Amazon may be hiring more people, but they don't necessarily have to uh, provide more wages because they don't have any competitors who are looking for the same the same people uh, on some level. So um, and just to to stay on that uh, field hearings for one moment, this is something that could be executed by really any entity. Right. I mean, you don't need to be control. You don't need to control. um uh, a state house. You don't need to control Congress. Uh, you don't need to be an elected official to begin to organize something like this around the country, do you? No, no. I, I think it's something that community organizations could certainly organize. I, and I, you know, I would, uh, you know, I think members of Congress and state attorneys general and local lawmakers, you know, should be really uh, pushed to attend. Um, but these are events that we, we could hold ourselves, that we could organize ourselves um, and, and, and really create a forum for people to talk about this and, and also talk about what, what should be done about it. Uh, number two, bring daylight to the nation's antitrust agencies. Um, what do you mean? You know, one of the things that um, is really striking when you go back and look at the history, um, you know, just... I spent some time spent some time looking at newspaper archives, you know, going through like the New York Times and and local newspapers, 30s, 40s, 1950s, 60s in that period, and they're they're filled with stories about monopoly and what the antitrust agencies are doing and how people are affected. Much uh, more public conversation, in part because the antitrust agencies themselves were much more open and uh, transparent and communicating about what what their activities were. Um, You know, in the part of what happened in this in the 1980s, when this whole shift to this other way of approaching antitrust uh, came about, was that antitrust sort of moved into the bureaucratic shadows. And it became this this exclusive domain of economists and legal scholars. And I think many people felt, many citizens felt, you know, that, that antitrust is it's like a technical thing. You know, you have to have specialized knowledge to, you know, talk about it or be involved in it in any way. Um, and so it was a way in which, you know, citizens really became l- locked out of the process and it became very invisible what was happening. I mean, to the point where, you know, we had some you know examples here recently um, under the Obama administration where these major decisions were made. You know, for example, um, you know U.S. airlines and and uh, American airlines when they proposed merging, the government. This is around 2013. The government initially sued to block that merger on the grounds that it would be too few airlines, and then they abruptly reversed course. 
um, and decided to approve it with uh, basically very few con- concessions of any kind. Um, there was no explanation from the government for why that happened. You know, what was the change in understanding that caused that? Uh, we also didn't know, except we know now because of an inadvertent disclosure um, of documents uh, given to a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, uh, we know that the staff of the Department of Justice Antitrust Division wanted to go after Google uh, in 2013 for being a monopoly. Um, and they built, you know, they made a very detailed case for why that was, and it, the political higher ups blocked them from doing that. You and I would never know that it happened had it not been from this accidental disclosure of documents to the Wall Street Journal. So there's this opacity and this way in which we as citizens have been locked out. It wasn't always this way. You know, when, um, you know, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, he was really, he he was one of our great, you know, our our biggest, most important anti-monopoly president and hero. And his second term, you know, as the Great Depression was sort of raging on, he realized that concentration was a big part of the problem. And he um, really, uh, he, he went out and he hired this guy, uh, Thurman Arnold, um, this uh, small town lawyer from, from Wyoming, to run the antitrust division of the Department of Justice. And Arnold came in and he, in, you know, and to revive this kind of somewhat sleepy agency, he recognized and to do, you know, what Roosevelt really had in mind, he recognized that he had to engage with the public. You know, one of the first things he did was he wrote this uh, long article for the New York Times Magazine, which is an address to his uh, fellow citizens on the monopoly issue. Um, it's like, you know, he's explaining why this was. And he, he set up uh, regional field offices all across the country to be kind of the eyes and ears on the ground. Um, and every time the agency would issue any kind of decision or do anything, they would issue an explanation explaining to people, you know, why they were doing what they were doing. Um, in the course of his term, they you know, increased uh, antitrust actions about eightfold. They grew the department. They made monopoly something that was part of the everyday discourse, how to deal with it, uh, and that people were involved in. And so it's just, it's just such a striking contrast to think about that model versus the model we have today where it's all closed off and the rest of us are left out of the conversation. So I think one of the most important things we need to do is drag the antitrust agencies into the daylight and and make this this is a democratic issue like any other issue and we should be talking about it should be in the papers we should now hold them uh, accountable to the way that they're making decisions and you also go on in number three to say set a higher bar for approving mergers which i think we've talked about a little bit rather than it be some uh, theoretical notion of Will it uh, raise prices for consumers, which it works out that it generally doesn't. But even putting that aside, you got to start to question whether or not um, you got to you got to value the principles of promoting competition, uh, of maintaining um, uh, a certain amount of equality of distribution of both um, of, of both capital and of uh, political power. That that needs to be in effect here. So so let's jump to uh, break up big tech. You, you mentioned as well that there was already a plan to break up Google, and we've certainly I think seen in um, the the recent weeks the 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 need to to break up uh, things like Facebook uh, and whatnot. Um, so let's jump to. Um, blocking big corporations from using their financial might to crush smaller competitors. How would you go about doing that? Companies like Walmart, and we've, we've talked about Amazon already, you know, where they, uh, they use their financial might to demand concessions from suppliers or to demand or to, to sell below cost in order to drive other businesses uh, out of the market. Um, those are, uh, you know, po- po- those are, Sorry about that. Um, our, our laws prohibit that kind of behavior, but because of changes in how we interpret and enforce them, uh, we're no longer essentially afor- enforcing any of those things. Um, it's going to take some time and it's going to take some patient work, but this is work that's already begun by um, legal scholars um, and, and uh, folks in the in- enforcement arena to say, you know, we really made a, a, a big mistake in the, in the 1980s when we moved away from 
uh, recognizing the dangers of these kinds of behaviors. Uh, and we now have legal, legal scholars who are um, creating uh, a new body of scholarship that shows, you know, in the case of Amazon, for example, um, exactly how uh, its behaviors are harming competition and ultimately harming the economy and what the theories are um, and the ways that we need to think about their business models in order to um, demonstrate that harm under our antitrust laws. So they're creating a new um, you know, body of legal thought in order to change how we approach enforcement and how courts appro- approach ruling on these cases. All right. And lastly, you talk about passing anti-monopoly policies at the local level, which I guess is sort of a workaround for those things that you may or may not be able to impact in terms of like a federal level. How would that work? Uh, and, and would it be is the idea to have a um, I guess in the way that like California, uh, you know, the, the 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 Trump administration wants to lower cafe standards. But uh, California, uh, because of the 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 size of its economy can basically dictate what how cars will be produced is the idea of doing something on a local level to sort of leverage the idea that these corporations want to become so large that if there are certain segments of the of the of of the country that they can't operate in it 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 leverages something or what's the theory behind local anti-monopoly policies there are a couple of reasons i think this is important uh one is that Antitrust is not the only way, not the only type of policy that we use to structure the economy. We have lots of other kinds of laws and and areas of policymaking, both at the federal and state and local level, that that structure markets that uh, govern how companies can operate. Many of these laws are specific to particular industries. You know, um, we have a whole host of banking laws, for example, um, that at one time, you know, kept uh, commercial banks and investment banks distinct and separate, and that limited the ability of banks to branch across state lines. We really wanted to keep a lot of our banking system more local and regional in focus. Those are anti-monopoly laws, effectively. They're not part of antitrust, but they're, you know, a policymaking that effectively defines how the economy is going to operate, how centralized it can be in terms of concentration of power. Um, so there's a there's a whole range of things outside of antitrust that are really important to think about. Um, it's even things like our, our subsidy uh, programs, you know, whether it's uh, things like what local governments um, do in terms of their economic development spending. We've got a, a number of cities around the country, for example, that are um, you know making these bids to land Amazon's second headquarters. Um, those kinds of giveaways are, have become common practice, and most of those big dollars go to a very small number of large companies. So, in effect, it's a way in which we're fueling monopoly instead of doing the opposite. Cities, um, you know, at the local level, we have a lot of power um, to protect our communities against monopoly. Um, and you know, there are things like, you know, in Oklahoma, there was a uh, uh, a, a ballot initiative in 2016 in which Oklahoma voters uh, put restrictions on large agribusiness. Um, the, in North Dakota, they actually have a law, it's called the Pharmacy Ownership Law, that prohibits chains from owning pharmacies. Every pharmacy in, in North Dakota is an independent, locally owned business. Um, and there's great evidence that no, North Dakota's uh, residents have lower prescription drug prices and much better service as a result. Um, New Jersey, uh, excuse me, Jersey City uh, and San Francisco both have policies that restrict the ability of chain stores to come in and, you know, sort of take over all the real estate. They have limits on them so that there's plenty of room for local entrepreneurs. There are a lot of communities now that have built publicly owned um, uh, fiber networks so that they don't have to have, you know, Time Warner and Charter, you know, be their Internet. So there are lots of ways at the local level um, that we can fight monopolies. And I think there, there's a political element of that, too, that the more that we engage there and the more that we sort of take control of these issues, we begin to build um, power in a way that can generate the momentum for federal changes as well. Stacy Mitchell, uh, co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, we will put a links to both those pieces at Majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And that was Stacy Mitchell. Uh, just a reminder, short show today, uh, no fun half.
I guess not a short show for most people, but uh, for members, sorry, short show today. We are redoing uh, the studio. Uh, we will be back live tomorrow, same place, same channel. Uh, check out, not sure if it's going to be uh, Michael Brooks' show tonight or tomorrow, but uh, check it out. All right, see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know Yeah.